Hello, my name is Robbie Fitzwater. I am the owner and operator of Marketing Rhythm. Um, we are a business that helps um, e-commerce businesses um, with retention marketing and email marketing. Um, we're going to talk about something that's it's always kind of fun, kind of unique to the space of email and e-commerce, um, first-party data. So um, get a lot of questions about this, especially after last like November um, with like iOS update 14.5, when again cookies become tracking becomes a little bit more problematic and moving forward, a cookieless future um, exists where we're not gonna have as much reliability on third-party data. But right now we live in a kind of a first-party data renaissance in some, so many ways because we have a lot of cool opportunities in terms of what we can do for businesses. And especially in the e-commerce space, businesses can do some really fascinating, unique things and it unlocks a lot of cool opportunities. So we'll talk through those opportunities, how you can apply them, how you can use them Kind of go through some examples of how you can think about them differently and then ways that we can start to kind of like understand the nuts and bolts difference between like what's first party data, what's second party data and what's third party data. Um, so let's dive in. But basically um, thinking about what is first party data? What is first party data? It's basically thinking about this in terms of like, what data are you able to collect as a, as a business? So what data are you able to individually collect about your individual customers and be able to store that data and that data is also going to be able to be leveraged for you moving forward. So basically whatever you can collect firsthand, basically that connection between you and your customer allows you to leverage that data in a lot of different ways. Some people may call this zero party data. Um, again, it's, it's other terms that are kind of bandied around a little bit, semantics, uh, tomato, tomato, but first party data, anything you're directly collecting. There's a lot of different ways you can be collecting that data, but basically any way that you're collecting that data to leverage in a forward facing way in your marketing. So you may be using that data in your emails to segment your audience differently. You may be using that in your automations to c connect the dots between, hey, this person's birthday is coming up, why don't we send them an email? You, those are all gonna be data points that you can use in a forward facing manner. So you're up on your toes being proactive in your marketing and it allows you to really align your customer journey really smoothly. And also it allows you to improve the overall experience for your customers. So there's lots of different ways you can use this. And this is that data when people talk about like, yeah, data is the, the oil of the 21st century. Um, this is where kind of this, this stuff comes into play because if businesses leverage this in a really powerful way, it can open up a lot of unique opportunities for business. So why is first party data important? First party, the reliability of third party data is really degrading in so many spaces across the internet. And basically, hey, your Google ads, your Facebook ads are not gonna be as effective as they used to be because the tracking and the quality of that tracking is gonna go down. So everybody's been having some issues with, again, Facebook, like in the last few years, um, this is, again, this is May, 2022, um, Facebook ads are becoming less, less reliable, less, again, impactful, your ROAS may be dropping pretty fast, um, and everybody's across the board on, in the digital space has been seeing this happening. Um, again, because iOS update 14.5, that tra those tracking is not as precise as it used to be, so it's changed the way that, that, that marketers can leverage that data to target specifically to the individuals because Facebook itself isn't able to track the same way. So third-party data becoming less reliable. Also, it basically because this is so unique and so valuable to the business, it allows you to create a really great, like again, seamless experience for that end user. So if I'm a business, I can, again, ideally create a really impactful contextual relationship with my customer because I can serve them uniquely how they need to be served. And we go through a lot of different ways we do this, but like we love to leverage use cases in terms of, hey, um, are you a, like we use the example of like children's clothing, are you a parent, a grandparent or a gift giver? All of those three groups are gonna need very different things. And if you can specifically speak to them how they need to be spoken to, that's a lot more powerful way of developing that relationship. And it also helps you understand like, hey, should I be communicating with a gift giver every single day, of the, every single week of the year? Maybe not. Maybe I need to, again, communicate with them in different specific times of the year or in different ways because it's not all gonna be as relevant or as, as impactful as, the way that I'm gonna be speaking to a, a parent who may need more information. So those are all gonna be a little bit different in the way that we approach them. Also, the way that this has changed business is kind of led to a direct -to consumer renaissance because this is so many, so much of the way that typical business structure has been 
framed in the past. It's like where you have a producer, a wholesaler, a retailer, and an end user. There's a lot of gap and a lot of distance between the producer of the product and the consumer of the product. So if you have multiple intermediaries, that's, again, from the business perspective, less margin you get, but also less data you can collect along the way. So the more that this is able to be compressed over the years, so we may not need, we may need wholesalers a little bit less, uh, we may not need retailers as much in some many ways, basically allows us to connect the dots between that direct consumer relationship and allow us to use that data in a really meaningful way to, again, drive revenue for the business because we're, creating that direct to consumer relationship where that always wasn't possible in the past with like, again, large retailer, large retailer relationships dictating a lot of the way that you businesses could interact. So that process has gotten much easier. And then since, since tools like, and, and resources like Shopify have been around, it makes, it's made it a lot easier for stores and businesses to you know, and create that because you're not developing the whole infrastructure from whole cloth. You have it kind of at your disposal. Like I always love the example of Heinz, um, Heinz, um, the ketchup brand, um, creating a Shopify store in three days during the beginning of the pandemic because they could. Um, that would take months and possibly years in the past, but they could do that really quickly here because they have all the infrastructure they need. They just need to put the content on there and allow it to be warehoused and get the fulfillment again sorted through but it makes that process a lot faster and a lot easier and then they're able to again develop a much deeper relationship with their customers granted not everybody's going to be purchasing heinz off heinz.com but they're super fans like that's where that's where they're going to be living and yeah they do have a subscription there um so examples of first party data and how we want to collect it we always look at things like our goal is like we always talk about like primary segmentation category like what are your segmentation categories and what is it what is going to define your different customer groups so am i a we talked about like parent grandparent gift giver am i a um if i'm a coffee business am i a coffee purchaser a, a, a do i like specialty unique coffees do i like standard coffees am i a decaf drinker all of those are going to help inform what's going to be the different components of how we're going to be speaking to them as unique individuals and going to help me understand how help us understand how to communicate with them and add value. Um, that could be around personal interests. That could be around, again, like somebody who's, uh, again, deeper in the brand than others. Um, and then there's even some kind of like unique ways we can do this in terms of like, what category of user are you? Are you a mountain bike rider, um, road bike rider, um, or a triathlete? Um, all different ways are going to need different things, um, but those use cases are going to be how we think about those a little bit differently. We can also think about first party data in terms of behavior. So are they engaged? This is where email, like the stuff, the strategy that you use in email can help in a forward facing way through your CRM um, in terms of like, hey, is this person engaged in 30 days, engaged in 60 days, engaged in 90 days? If not, what can we do? If this person has visited a site or visited your store, that's again, first party data you're able to collect. Are they, have they submitted forms? Have they reviewed products? Um, have they, do they follow on social? All of these things are, are data points that you can use to interact and engage. Have they submitted a, submitted a request online? Have they, have they had a, a complaint that's been alleviated? Have they had a problem? All of this thing is first party data you can use to understand, hey, if this person's canceled their subscription in the last 10 days, you're probably not gonna, again, communicate subscription to them, hopefully not. Um, so you really can use that in different ways. You may also put in like understanding of, hey, where are they in their customer journey? Are they receiving their welcome sequence? Are they lapsed customer? Are they being nurtured? Have they recently purchased? Where are they in that customer journey? And this is gonna allow you to, again, adjust and tailor your communications accordingly. Are they in certain geographic regions? Are they, what are their demographics? Are they in geographic regions? What's their age, time, country, zip code? All of that nuts and bolts, are they male, female, device preferences, like do they lean on mobile, do they lean on desktop, or they are they open to SMS, are they not open to SMS? All of that data is going to be hope, super helpful here. Um, or in some cases, like what categories they may fit into too. So like a purchaser versus non-purchaser, um, are they a high average order value purchaser, low AOV purchaser? Um, are they a subscriber? If we have a subscription-based product, are they a non-subscriber? Do they purchase apparel, equipment? Um, all of these different places are going to be different ways we can use this. And also, I think one area where I think more businesses are going to be looking at, are they an omni-channel purchaser versus a single-channel purchaser? We are having we have one client who recently migrated over to Shopify POS, and it's been really illuminating 
and kind of interesting to see, hey, um, our emails and the work we're doing on the retention side are driving a lot of in-store transactions because we're keeping them engaged. They may not be transacting through e-commerce every single time, but if they're, again, opening emails, clicking emails, engaging in emails, they're, again, and then they're converting in an in-store relationship. That's a really powerful way. Also with a high, again, a high ticket transaction, they may actually be calling in the store. So again, our emails are engaging them ahead of time and then they're actually calling in to convert and purchase there. So it, they, they can't make that full transaction with the information they need there. They wanna to talk to an expert to feel safe and confident making that decision. And that's what allows for that unique relationship because suddenly we can say, hey, this person, again, open an email, click an email, and suddenly they're calling in like 20 minutes later um, because they need a little bit of that, that last little bit, that last little nudge or that last little bit of help. Um, that's again that omni-channel purchaser that's really unique and really valuable and typically those are going to be the highest value cohorts in your audience so again take care of them well and thinking more more so in the future those are going to be more and more valuable over time um different one kind of group that i think has done this really really well and kind of like this is kind of my example of like i always joke about it like the most like the one of the biggest moments in e-commerce that nobody talks about was when Nike did the Nike announced their direct to consumer offense in 2017. Um, they basically said, Hey, we're going to be pulling out of like 30 to 50% of our retail channel partners. And we're also, we're just going to be focusing a lot more attention on our direct to consumer and our owned app relationships, like owned app, like the Nike run plus app and the sneakers app. Um, basically we're going to pull out of so many places because we can develop a direct consumer relationship through Nike.com. And if we can sell through there and own those niches with, with high average, or, high average order values and mainly high lifetime values, um, we can be a lot more profitable, generate a lot more revenue and also deepen the relationships we have with our best customers. So we're focusing on our right customers on our, not the bright customers, um, more narrow, less broad, but more revenue in those in those niches because maybe a runner spends eight hundred dollars a year on Nike versus somebody else who may spend fifty dollars every two years. You want to focus on that 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 high value category. So they have things like their Nike Run Plus app, which has so many different ways that they can connect data with value to the customer, and also vice versa. So they have training plans they make available to end users. They have like like unique playlists. They offer them like exclusive deals on new gear, um, early releases, um, also like a GPS functionality inside the app. So you can use that to train for a race. But Nike on the other side, they get so much great first party data there because they suddenly understand, hey, if I'm training for a race, they know how much I've been running because I'm using their GPS functionality. They know what I'm training for, possibly what the date of the race is. And like, hey, if I've written, dr ran 500 miles since since I purchased my for my pair of shoes, my race day is coming up. Like, hey, we can send a nudge saying, hey, um, looks like you've been running really consistently. Um, here's here we notice you may need a new pair of shoes. Um, this is when you need to replace your shoes. Or like, hey, your race is coming up. Here's five percent off a pair of shorts for race day. It's unique ways that they can kind of tailor that relationship and connect with that customer so deeply. But it's really powerful in the way that they're able to kind of leverage that as a broad business and deepen the relationships and deepen those, deepen that, um, the way that business interacts. How to collect first party data. This is another area where this is kind of unique because in the past, this would, this would take a, like you, in some ways you'd need like a marketing research firm to actually help you do this or like a really great a diligent team to input this in your, in your CRM inside your store. But basically we can collect first party data through email. Like that's again, one unique way. We can also collect it through surveys or quizzes. You see a lot more groups using like Octane, Octane, Octane AI um, in their, um, yeah, Octane um, in their, um, on their sites where they can do again, quizzes to collect data, to leverage, to make recommendations, but also to improve that again, understanding of the customer. You can also use quizzes or forms to understand, hey, can I, do, does this person fit into this category, this category? We like to do that segmentation early, typically, like in either a popover form for data collection or a welcome sequence to see them, again, self-select into a specific category. But if we can do that early, it's gonna make for a lot more impactful relationship over time. Um, you can also, again, collect that through SMS. You can collect it through the website of like pages viewed, again, products viewed, um, time on site. All of those are gonna be collecting in the background. If you have an app, um, that app, 
could be collecting a lot of really great data that you could be using. And that's where that omni-channel relationship may really come to play a role. And then also if you have an in-store POS and that's connected to your online POS or your, again, data management system, that's also going to be a place where that data can live and you can collect more and layer on top of it time after time after time. And if you can really do that well, it's going to allow you to leverage it in a forward facing manner, but also prevent you from prevent you from, again, having any issues with data security, data privacy and um, being being mindful and con consistent around there. Um, how to use first party data like we've talked about, again, some of this already, but connecting everything together with your CRM like this is where I think this is going to be a larger push moving forward is like, hey, we have online customers, we have offline customers. How do we connect those together in our CRM to understand what that customer journey looks like, what that buyer profile looks like, and what they're finding value in? Um, we also want to be using it to connect like, connect that context, that buyer, with the interactions we want to see. So we can, again, recommend, recommend relevant products, recommend relevant content that's going to be specific for them. Um, like, again, one equestrian group we have, like, they have different types of writers they are they they serve. So like based on what types of writing they do, we want to serve them out content and product recommendations are going to be specific and consistent with that type of writing and allow them to um, get the best content they, they need. But it's just super relevant for them because like, oh, my gosh, they see me as a like I, I do eventing versus like versus jumping again, specific different discipline and again they're seeing me as me and they're serving me in the way that i need to be served and it goes a long way in that level of personalization um and then this can even be le leveraged across platforms too so like if you have buy online pick up in store this can be do some cool things here too um and then like the more actionable the data is the more it can be leveraged so Ideally, this is a place where you want to be, again, developing enough trust to collect more data. Again, that data is going to be a function of the level of trust you have, and like you have to kind of earn the right to ask for more. But once you do, you can start to collect more. So like if you can, again, start a relationship off, you may be asking for their birth date later on. You may be asking for other information later on, too. But each data point you get, it gives you a way to, again, leverage moving forward, it gives you just another at-bat. So like if I collect a birth date, I have a reason to reach out again ahead of that person's birthday and maybe after that person's birthday. Um, if like, again, I mentioned the horse's birthday, like I know their horse, we know their horse's birthday and their, and their horse's name. Like that's a really impactful connection, touch point that we can, again, layer on top of what we're already doing. So it gives our automations a really unique way to serve them uniquely and serve them at the right time, the right place, and with a message that's powerful and relevant for them. So those are just ways that we can leverage this to, especially on the email side and the e-commerce side, to really create unique experiences that serve them as unique consumers. Could go on for days here, guys. So um, what's the difference between first-party data and third-party data, second-party data, and what are the pros and cons of each? So kind of thinking about this, like, okay, so we have our first-party data or zero-party data we've talked about, second-party data. This is where you may have a partner or a group you're working with and this is basically two groups borrowing each other's first party data so like if i'm a if i'm a um if i'm a retailer a clothing retailer and i per partner with a travel brand again they again we know their data the data they may have like they have travelers from different areas or different things that they may be collecting and we're leveraging their second party data their data to again connect with our audiences or connect or layer on top of what we're using already to enhance or improve what we have, that's going to be a use of second party data to kind of improve the way we can perform or improve the context we can layer on top of what we're doing. Um, the second party data piece is like that collaborate is, is a little bit more difficult because there's more collaborative and depending on the relationships you may have with different businesses. Um, some businesses may be more comfortable with that second party data relationship. A lot of media brands and media businesses are really thrive here because they have data they're collecting on a regular basis that you can use in conjunction with what you're, you have in addition to. So that's where some cool opportunities lie. Um, third party data is gonna be a little different. That's typically gonna be leveraged by a third party ad aggregator. Um, that's like that's the Googles, that's the Facebooks, that's the third, that's the um, groups that are again programmatically serving up ads, programmatically serving up content. They're going to be a little bit larger 
larger groups, again, aggregating, aggregating information. They own the data, you don't own the data. That's where this component becomes really unique because again, like Facebook owns all of their relationships. They, Amazon owns all of their relationships. You're borrowing them, you're leveraging their platform. You don't own that data. You don't own that relationship the same way there, which makes it a little bit more volatile. But again, you have to kind of balance that volatility with the opportunity presented on those platforms and the opportunity presented through the acquisition and growth side of things too. So it's there's there's advantages. Benefits to first party data, like like kind of a quick rundown, like owning they're owned by you. You can tie it to different areas of your organization. The omni-channel measurement makes things a little bit more buttoned up. You can really understand where how your marketing is perform, performing in different areas. And it also allows for better attribution throughout your marketing funnel. So you can attribute to where that revenue is coming from or what's driving that revenue a little bit better than if you were just kind of flying blind, like I mentioned earlier with the um, Shopify POS integration. It gives a lot of really cl clear, unique information. Um, it allows you to improve the customer experience. Um, that customer experience goes a long way. It's going to become more and more important over time because everybody's going to be trying these strategies. So expectations are just going to be set higher and higher and higher. Um, remember when two-day shipping was a big deal and blow people away? Now it's pretty pretty par for the course. Now everybody wants one-day shipping. Um, expectations continually rise and evolve. So this is a way to, again, improve that experience alongside with what people are expecting. Um, and then it also creates a much, again, more, a much better single view of the customer. You get to serve them in unique, different ways. You understand how that customer is going to be different than this customer. And for that messaging, for those relationships, for the product recommendations or the content recommendations, you just get to do a lot better work here. And that's what kind of makes this unique because this wasn't always possible in the past, but now it is. And that first party data can be leveraged in so many cool ways um, that make them so powerful. One of the challenges businesses run into, we see um, typically like like lack of strategy or like what data should we be collecting? What are we gonna do with it? Um, it kind of like data soup, essentially. Um, it's no real strategy around collection or leveraging that. They're just like trying to collect everything and it may be, it may be actionable, it may not be. Trying to be intentional about how you wanna create, create relationships through this data or improve the customer experience through this um, is gonna be really important. They may be having data silos across organizations where like sales and marketing may not be communicating well with each other. Um, that's can offer some, some challenges um, to try and overcome, but connecting those data and aligning that data um, is going to be really important over time. Um, it allow the communication between teams, the again, challenges on like who owns our email list, who owns this list, how are we going to communicate with this segment? How are we not going to bombard people with like emails from our sales team and emails from our our, our email service provider. Um, all of this is going to be really relevant, and all of this is going to be help, help, hopefully helpful in in people in, in building strategies around this. So that's where this can become a challenge sometimes. Um, one challenge of this can be to like just building trust. Um, if your business hasn't been a trustworthy business in the past, or not viewed as trustworthy, uh, or more transactional, um, the basically, like I said, you have to earn the right to ask for more data. The more trusted you are, the more the easier it is to ask for that data. That's what's going to help ideally you moving forward. And then integrating that data across platforms. Again, that connection piece and systems piece is always a challenge. So wanting to make sure that that's going to be buttoned up and tightened up across the, um, across the organization. So thinking about all of this. I, I know we talked through a lot, uh, but hopefully it gives you kind of a high level view of how to think about first party data and how to leverage it. Again, this is going to be one thing that's going to be more and more important for businesses moving forward because we have so much great access to that data, because we can use it in so many more power, so many powerful ways. We can really start connecting dots in different ways than were possible in the past. But that first party data and that strategy around how do I collect it, how do I leverage it, and how do I enhance it? is going to be super important for groups moving forward so they're not so dependent on third party providers. And this is where again you get to take the you get a again get a rock and roll and especially in the e-commerce space, especially as easy as it is to start collecting this data and leveraging it, this is where these e-commerce e-commerce businesses are going to be some of the more innovative and innovative and exciting businesses to watch because they're the ones doing the best work. They're the ones doing the most innovative things. And they're the ones that are also going to see the benefit on the other side. Um, so this was a very broad topic, very unique topic. If 
any of you guys have questions, let me know. Let us know. Um, we would love talking shop on this. This is a really quickly evolving space. So if we missed anything, call us out. Call me out. I saying like, Robbie, you were, you were way off on that. Like, you missed the boat. Um, want to know, want to hear, like poking holes, um, being like, again, interrogating these, these conversations is super helpful. So let me know. Want to know more. And if you have questions or comments, reach out. We love talking shop. And um, until we until we have another one of these, uh, we'll see you guys around. Bye-bye.